thanks. I was really just responding to <clears throat> to things that people were saying about first use. I, I think just well to come to, to ask a question to to Rebecca. Uh, I, I accept what you say about not distracting the issue with uh, the issue of no first use uh, when when that's not necessarily going to lead to the <clears throat> complete disarmament that we're looking for. Uh, but is there an argument? <clears throat> well, I, I have obviously presented in various articles an argument that, that the UK is, regardless of, of the fact it's not signed the TPNW, it is legally obliged to change its policy to have no first use. When I started out in this, this uh, process, I would have preferred to get to the answer that they were legally obliged to not have nuclear weapons, but I couldn't get there. And this was as far as I could get. And therefore, I, I, I think that <clears throat> I, I, I think it, that there is a, a case for, for putting legal pressure on the, on the UK to change its policy to no first use on a, on a unilateral basis. Thanks, Brian, and thanks for putting the link um, to your article in the in the chat. And I will take a look at that article. I have seen quite a lot of articles making this uh, going going right back quite a long way, actually. And I think most recently, people like John Wolfstall, I think, uh, has, has 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 you know pushed hard on this uh, in the U.S. I have to say, bottom line, and I think you put in, in, your, in, in your chat, if you're arguing for the UK to introduce a no first use agreement, please stop. We do not want a no first agreement with any other nuclear armed states because the legal issue that will come up will be very confusing because the way those things work, the government so, so, is going to then argue that um, it is going to co-opt that. And so, let me explain what I mean by that. Because so, sorry, Rebecca, could I just come in? Sorry, that was a, that was a typo in my oh, that chat. Was a typo. It, is, it is not an agreement. I, I put an agreement, but what I actually meant to write was policy. Ah. It is, it, I am purely arguing for a unilateral policy. I accept the point about agreements, and I would not, I would not argue for that. Okay, Thank, thanks, thanks for that um, uh, clarification, uh, Brian. So I don't object to it, but I wonder how much energy we want to put into it. And I'll say why. Because, you know, the UK and the US and France and China and, and Russia exerted enormous pressure, uh, but the UK and France and, and the US and Russia in particular, when the International Court of Justice was doing its analysis back in um, uh, the 1990s. Um, and the moment that the ICJ had that very equivocal aspect, it had one unequivocal, you know, it had the, the, the um, unanimous that said there exists in law, um, you know, an obli oh, there it exists, an obligation to negotiate and bring to a conclusion, which was a clarification of Article 6 that was helpful and that was unanimous and that was very good. But on the issue of use, the way the ICJ ended up dealing with it, and that's why it's so important in the report that I actually quote from Judge Bajawi, who was the, the, the president of the um, ICJ uh, at that time, because when he attended the Edinburgh conference, that um, and, um, uh, Janet Fenton, who's here now, and also Angie Zelter and I, out of kind of Fazl the Faslane 365 team, we organized a conference in Edinburgh at, um, what was it called, uh, that lovely Earth Home uh, place. Anyway, we organized that, which was on uh, Trident and international law. Uh, essentially, you know, what does this mean for Scotland? And we... If it, we had quite a lot of, of, of legal um, uh, people um, coming to it. And then there was a massive snowfall uh, in, uh, not in Scotland actually, but in, uh, that, that just covered Southern England. All flights canceled from, um, uh, what was it called? Uh, Heathrow and was, was, was Philippe Sands was going to fly up from Southampton, all that sort of thing. But nevertheless, we did have um, Christopher Wiramantri and Judge Bajawi had submitted um, uh, a, a, a paper to, to it. 
And in it, Angie had asked him a very specific question about a hundred kiloton trident warhead. Would that have met the criteria that was part of the equivocation? And Judge Bajawi said at that time, and we put it in the book, um, Trident and International uh, Law, uh, that this would not have met that criterion of uh, supreme national interests or extreme circumstances. And, uh, but what we actually found, and, and this is why I'm saying this, Brian, is because the minute you'd get an agreement like that, just like, you know, how many times do the, the, does the UK, the Westminster government trot out that they've, that they've, that nuclear weapons are no longer targeted? All that means is a, it's a computer change. And it can be retargeted, as I said earlier, in 15 minutes. They also trot out that they have several days notice to fire. And they trot it out to get lots of brownie points every time they turn up at an NPT meeting. But it actually doesn't mean real change in, in their operations. And so no first use would not mean real change in any UK op, um, operation at all unless it went along with some of the de-alerting practicality operational things that John Ainsley talked about. If it doesn't entail those, don't give them that, you know, brownie point, don't, because they will use it and they will use it against the TPNW. They will use it against all of us. So make them deal with the fact that what they have every time Trident goes out, they have the ability, the capability and the option to fire it first, second or last. And none of those firings is legal under international humanitarian law at all. If you take that explanation from Judge Bajawi about the 100 kiloton, none of it is legal under the TPNW either. And the TPNW stigmatizes those uses and therefore also then the deployment of, of nuclear weapons under you know, the nuclear deterrence doctrines because that is deployment with the purpose of threatening to use nuclear weapons. That's what it is. And that's why the Trident 3 dumped the computers overboard back in 1999, um, Ellen and, and Ulla and, and Angie. It was precisely on the grounds of that. And I argued in their court case that, and as you know, they actually got um, acquitted. And then of course, an appeal was taken and they lost the appeal. So, you know, be very, very careful about unintended consequences, Brian. And I'm afraid that I think, I haven't read your pieces, so I'm, I, I would need to read them in detail. But I think that what you're arguing for could very well be uh, counterproductive and certainly could really undermine what we're trying to do to bring the TP, to, to get the UK to take the TPNW seriously and, um, and also to implement its existing obligations under the NPT. It's, you know, no first use is, is, it's called declaratory policy for a good reason. It ain't worth the paper it's written on, except for the nuclear armed states that want to keep producing and making and deploying nuclear weapons. Then it's worth them having, because it's in their interests to have. <laughs>